Well, greetings, brethren, and welcome to this last day of Unleavened Bread service here for 2014. Today, we'll be playing the full sermon. Some of you saw the 10-minute version we have, the first 10 minutes we have on YouTube with a lot of um, video action. We have the full sermon, and it stops after 10 minutes and then says you can see the rest of it here on the last day of Unleavened Bread. We have it here for you as promised, and it will include, and this will be a little bit different version than the one on presently, the 10-minute the ten version, because this one has the entire sermon with captions, with the full text that will scroll on the screen behind me. We'll put Mr. Armstrong on the screen with me here in just a moment, and then we'll fade him out and bring the lyrics, or not the lyrics, but the text full screen so you can see the captions, the text, while Mr. Armstrong speaks. Some of you told me that you really, really like that. It's really helpful to you. So uh, we went to a little bit of trouble to do that. We'll be rolling that in just a couple minutes. I just want to give a little introduction to it. Wish you a wonderful last day of unleavened bread. And, you know, we can go back to eating leavened bread, but that doesn't mean we can return to sin. It just, just means the symbolism of the days of unleavened bread are over until another year. Hopefully in Petra, maybe, you know? The way things are going, are you watching World News Daily? Hope you are. Hope you're tuning in to Nightcast or some good news program and keeping a tune as Jesus Christ instructed us to do to be watching world news and be an active uh, part of what's happening in world news because of watching it and then praying about it and watching God respond to your prayers. Brethren, he can respond to our prayers about world news events. When we cry out about something we see happening, he may alter it a little bit because of what we see that we ask him to do. And of course, he's, he's awake to the promises he made in prophecy about how things are going to work out, and he's not going to um, deviate from that any, but he will listen to us when we have a concern about something, and if he can do it, watch. Try it. Put something special in your prayer about something you see in the world news, and really pour your heart into it. See if it doesn't move God. I mean, don't test him, but just, well, yeah, do test him. He says, you know, regarding tithing, he says that. Put me to the test, you know. See if I don't bless you. If you do it from a cheerful point of view, and today is a day to give an offering to the eternal, and um, there's a good book to read if you don't know, wow, where do I send my tithe money, dear God? Read the one and ending your financial worries, pray over it, and ask God to guide you and lead you with what he tells you there, with how to, what to do with his money. And uh, we don't have an easy way, I don't think we do anyway, for you to know how to send your Holy Day offering here, should any of you want to do that, to help this ministry which struggles along with the poorest of equipment. Well, we've been blessed with some outstanding equipment, frankly, but our computers are ancient and old, sometimes hang up. And I'd love to update those, but, um, but we're able to struggle by with what we have if we have to do it that way. So let God be your guide. Just a reminder that today is a day to bring an offering before the eternal. Now, with... Just this little introduction to Mr. Armstrong, I want to just tell you what we're going to do this coming Sabbath and remind you about Nightcast. We'll be off tonight. We'll be back again tomorrow night and then the rest of this week through Thursday night and back on our usual Sunday through Thursday schedule all the way up till May 13. Sunday night, we'll skip that one for the second Passover. And if you know anyone who missed the first Passover who will need the second Passover, I used to work with that in Pasadena and help put that on, on from the recital hall every year. And if you need that this year, we will have be conducting a service that evening at 8 p.m. in each and every time zone in the continental United States. We'll also be doing it in Alaska and in Hawaii and at 8 p.m. And we will um, actually 7 p.m. for Hawaii because of 
the way the sun sets over there. And we'll be doing it at uh, 7.30 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time, London time for, for those in the UK and in the European area around there who might have missed the first Passover. Mr. Armstrong will be conducting that. Robert Collins will introduce Mr. Armstrong and it's an outstanding Passover service. So if you missed the first, you're welcome to join us on May 13. And if you know someone who missed the first Passover, friends who wants to keep the Passover, be sure to let, let them know we have that available here. And on our calendar tab, we've got instructions of what people need to have set up at their home in order to do the Passover online with us and be all ready for it. Now this Sabbath, I'm going to, I'm planning, I'm doing, already doing the research and the study, and I plan to cover something that a student, one of the earliest students from Brickett Wood, uh, the earliest he went, I think in the 50s he went, uh, writing a report that uh, just got into my hands from him this week. Now I often get emails from him with leads on news stories, I really appreciate those. He's asked me to not mention his name, though, and I appreciate his humility and uh, desire to just serve and not need mention of a name. And, but if you read his article, his name is on the article. But I'm going to go through, I plan to go through his article this coming Sabbath. It's an extremely interesting subject. It's a subject that I talked to some of my friends about um, not long after Mr. Armstrong died. We, I was saying that, you know, God could resurrect him. And the man's writing I'm going to go through points out scriptures that shows how, uh, from what God said, God's got no other option according to this writing. Now, I haven't studied that fully yet, but it's very interesting. We'll go through it whether I agree with it or not. We're going to go through it in the scriptures that are listed there. So far, though, I'm seeing that things are looking kind of positive and I did make the statement that and one reason I some fellows criticized me for getting on the uh, ushering crew out in or staying on the ushering crew I've been on the ushering crew for 25 years at headquarters some fellows refused to be on the ushering crew once the apostasy was underway I said I we don't want to do any service for these apostate ministers you know uh, well some of them I said to them, I said, no, look, fellows, what if God were to resurrect Mr. Herbert Armstrong and he come to the door of the auditorium? Wouldn't you want one of us being on the usher staff to run over and open the door where some of the apostates on the ushering staff might try to bar the door? Wouldn't we rather have the reverse of what happened on the during one of the days of the attempted takeover by... Uh, the state of California, when a lawsuit was against the church back in 1979, I think that was, I was there for a lot of those activities and in the buildings, singing with arm in arm with my fellow brethren and willing to go off to uh, be put in prison if we had, or, you know, a jail cell if we had to over, over, because uh, we were there during a church service and if they, wanted to interrupt our church service and haul us off and put us in jail, we were willing to, you know, have that happen to us. I was there with that, too. But there were some inside the auditorium on a critical day. One man, I couldn't believe he did it. And when I found out who it was, even just recently, I shook my head and said, wow, how could one of those earliest students of Ambassador College do that against Mr. Armstrong? but uh, it still worked out okay in spite of it all. But the man was inside the auditorium and when the deceiver was out there trying to, to get in and interrupt the church service inside, uh, this one man went up and opened the, you know, most of the faithful brethren, mm -mm, well, they just stood there and said through the door like, you know, once a library's closed or something like that and they don't want to let you in or the post office, sorry, we're closed, oh, but I got this important letter to mail. I'm sorry, it's five o'clock, we're closed. Well, the faithful brethren were inside not opening the doors and saying through the glass, uh, sorry, we got a church service in progress here. You can't interrupt this church service. And 
No way were they going to open the door. Some of you aren't going to believe this. I'm going to mention the name. Dr. Hay was the one that went up and opened the door for the deceiver and let him in. I could hardly believe it when I heard my ears on that the other day. And I heard it from not one, but several sources and credible sources. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it be much better, brethren, to have a faithful person inside the auditorium if, if and when God resurrected Mr. Armstrong? Of course, you know, for the moment, the auditorium is lost, and that didn't happen, and God didn't, didn't resurrect Mr. Armstrong back then. But, you know, knowing God could have, one of my reasons for when they were short on ushers for saying, yes, I'll, I'll help out, an usher was to be out there with the ushers in case God resurrected Mr. Armstrong. I could go bang that door open for Mr. Armstrong. Come on in, Mr. Armstrong. <laughs> And, uh, I, you know, I'm laughing, but I'm also serious, brethren. Uh, and one of the things we'll go through this Sabbath is the writing by the man that um, I'm researching, looking at. It's a long writing, and I'm going to try to summarize it for you. But go through the whole thing. Is pointing out how and why God must resurrect Mr. Armstrong to be one of the end-time two witnesses and who he might resurrect as the second of the two witnesses, someone related to Mr. Armstrong, and why that might be is in this article that I'm planning on going through with you, for those of you that tune in here on the regular weekly Sabbath. That's going to put me to a lot, it's a long paper, it's going to put me to a lot of effort to have that ready for this Sabbath, but that's my plan. So those of you who can try to give me a break this week, let me apply myself and, and work toward having that ready for this Sabbath. Okay, now, talk about resurrecting Mr. Armstrong. You know, um, now, just for fun, we can do that electronically, electronically. You know, Mr. Armstrong is not really here, but I'm going to put him in the other chair on the other side of this by a little electronic means, and then we're going to roll his tape and then put him here, and then we'll make the uh, whole screen, the whole text go full screen in a moment. But, uh, Mr. Armstrong, if we can get you to join us, come on in, sir. <laughs> hey, Mr. Armstrong. Okay, he's going to speak by recording from his home in Tucson by microwave from a sermon he gave on March 2nd, 1981. It's an excellent last day of Unleavened Bread sermon because of how it points to things that relate to Pentecost, the next Holy Day coming up, and, and about not only putting sin out of our lives, but about, but about being diligent in prayer. And Well, you'll hear him. It's an excellent sermon. Some of you saw, or maybe here watching this, because you saw the 10-minute the version of this that we have on YouTube. Maybe it's on Facebook, too. I'm not sure. But anyway, this is a, we, we did that right here, the 10-minute the, the one you saw. And now this is the full version with lyrics, or not lyrics, but with text for the whole thing. Again, from March 2, 1981, here's Mr. Armstrong with that. I'm sure. 
sure we all fall very far short. All of us, the speaker included, and all of the audience and myself, we all do. The general conditions in the world recently fulfilling biblical prophecy have been speeding up, they've been accelerating, and they indicate that the time is coming when God's work for this time is nearing its completion. We may be farther along and farther toward the completion of this great work, and it is a great work for so small a people as we are, that it may be nearer finished than we think or than we realize. We're coming in now on the home stretch, and we started a program in the work this year of speeding it up. Now, just in the last week or ten days, the largest and the most powerful, the leading television stations in Chicago, in Denver, Colorado, and in Kansas City have been added, and the program will now go out on those television stations. We have WOR, a very powerful station in New York City, and other television stations over the country, but the television coverage, the radio coverage, has been quite low. Now we're beginning to speed it up, and I'm having to ask our brethren everywhere to begin a little deeper. I haven't been asking our brethren for the past more than two years. I certainly haven't been high-pressuring our brethren for special offerings or contributions or anything of the kind. And yet, we have operated on a balanced budget. And I think we need to thank God for that. Now, I said before, when we please God, and the way we conduct ourselves in the church and in the work, God blesses the work. And the work speeds up, and it goes ahead, and it increases. This work did please God, and it did grow from its beginning back in 1933 until, well, for 35 years, we grew at the rate of 30% increase every year over the year before. Now, that's a very great increase for a continuous steady increase. I don't mean it precisely 30% every year, and I'm sure you understand that. Some years it might have been 26, 27%, other years 34, 35. But an average 30%, it was close to that, right on for 35 years. And then I was away. And I was not in charge of Pasadena, I had it delegated. And the work began to go the other way. The doctrines, the teaching of the church, began to be watered down. The broadcast had been built up until we were purchasing more wattage of radio power than any other program on earth. And of course, we were on radio in those days. Now, back in 1955, I went on television. But it only lasted for six months because I found a bit of all of my time and sometimes had to be devoted to other phases of the work. So that only lasted for six months. And then we went on radio daily. We went on the big powerhouse radio stations all over the United States. We were the biggest radio program on earth. But after some 10, 12 years, uh, this, our radio program was really the tail end and the bottom of what we got as religious programs uh, on the air. Of course, now television is the main thing. And I thought it was 1955, but I found at that time radio was not yet dead. Anyway, the last two years, I've been working as hard as I could to get us all back on God's track. And brethren, I tell you, we've been making good, good improvement. I don't think we're all the way back on God's track. I don't think, brethren, that we are praying hard enough. I don't think we're spending enough time with our Bibles. I don't think that we're close enough to God, and we need to get a lot closer to Him than we are. And if we do, you'll find this work will speed up faster than ever. I've been saying that we have to sort of tighten up our belts. We have to begin to cut down our living standards because the whole nation of the United States is going to have to cut down its living standards. There are reasons why that's going to happen to everybody in this country. And we need to put extra money now into the work of God in order that we will be reaching more and more people and that will in time bring in more and more co-workers to help us and with the financial load. But it's like pump priming. We're going to have to put some money in it now uh, in, in order to cover the additional cost of new and additional television stations, of uh, getting the plain truth out on newsstands more and more, of purchasing large space in newspapers and magazines like the Reader's Digest and the uh, TV Guide that uh, have 20, 30, 40 million, something like that, circulation. That many copies going out, each copy may be read by two or three people, or sometimes more, and that means reaching millions and millions of additional people. Now, out of those millions, God is going to cause some 
who began contributing, and he's going to bring others into the church, and God will add to the church, such as he is choosing to be saved. And that's going to come right along. So the dynamic church for this year has already started. The time has come now, my brethren, that we need to have a clear update on what and why is the church. And why, why is the church, and what is its work, and also, why is the church in its work for this time now as compared to the first century when it first started? Now, Jesus said, as you find recorded in Matthew 16, verse 18, he said, I will build my church. Now, why did he want to build a church? You know, most people just take a church for granted. I've known of churches, and I've seen churches, you know, most people think of a church as a building, with a slot sloping roof, a steeple pointing up to heaven, and uh, a cross on its facade, and uh, they think that people go to the church. Actually, in the Bible, it's the church that goes to the building to meet. Uh, and so the world has it all wrong. But very few people know why Jesus started the church, and why we needed a church. They just didn't know there is one. Just like uh, I myself, I've seen churches ever since I was a little boy, but it never occurred to me to wonder why, why there should be one. And I wonder if you ever remembered that or ever thought about it. Well, let's begin at the very beginning. Now, once again, I've mentioned this before. If I ask you, where is the beginning of everything in the Bible? You know, the farthest back in history, you say Genesis 1 1, would you? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? No, that's not the beginning. Because that God didn't create the earth and the heavens that are spoken of in Genesis 1 at that time. He could have created those later. But the beginning is in John 1, and beginning with verse 1 in the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the Word is a person, just called a personage. In the Greek in which that was originally written, uh, it is called the Logos, or he is called the Logos, a personage. But the personage means Word. Logos means Word or uh, spokesman. That is the spokesman. He, the spokesman, was with God. And the spokesman was also God. Now, there are two people, there's the spokesman and God, and the spokesman is God, and he's with God. So, there we are. I mentioned now my son, and I could say, he, he's a person, I'm a person, and uh, uh, there, there are two of us, and we have the same name. We're both Armstrong. Now then, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word also was God, was God. The things in the beginning with God, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now over in Ephesians, the third chapter, you read that God created all things by Jesus Christ. Well, now notice verse 14 right here in John 1. Verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, became Jesus Christ. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, then... Jesus, prior to his human birth, was the Word, and he was with God, and he was God, and he has always existed. Now, you read elsewhere in the Bible that he's without father, without mother, without beginning of days, without end of life. Eternal. The eternally existing one. The same as God. He has always existed. There never was a time when the Word, who became Jesus Christ, and the one we call God the Father, did not exist. But the Father directed what he should do and created all things by Jesus Christ. He spoke, and the Holy Spirit was the power that went out from them and did what he had commanded and what he asked. Now then, um, that is the farthest back in time sequence that we have any uh, anything in the Bible. But there were just the two. Now, there was no, no matter so far as I understand. And I, I, I don't find anything in the revelation of God, his word, which I have right here on the desk in front of me, I don't find anything indicating there was any material substance, any matter, any earth or any other kind of material uh, place like the earth that existed prior uh, to the time of this earth, necessarily. Now, God is creator. He created all things by Jesus Christ. But what does God create? And Jesus said that he had not spoken of himself, he only spoke what the Father who sent him told him to speak when he was a human being here on earth. And so in creating, God the Father is the mastermind who says what will be done, and Christ is the one who speaks, the Holy Spirit responds, and it is done. And that is the way they create. But what are they creating? What is their purpose? 
I'm reminded how Winston Churchill said before the United States Congress during World War II that there is a purpose being worked out here below. I've re uh, repeated that, I guess, hundreds of times. But it's so true. And God is working out a purpose here below. Now, what is God's main purpose? What was it from the beginning when there was just the two of them? They hadn't created anything. What were they going to create? What is God creating? What is his overall purpose? His overall purpose is to create righteous and holy character. Now, I talked about you holy, righteous people. Well, I'm no more holy and righteous than you are, nor you than I am. But God has a purpose of making us that way. And God's purpose is to create holy and righteous character such as he himself has. Now, God is that kind of character. God is perfect, holy, and righteous character. And God's purpose is to create that kind of character in other created beings. Now, to do that, first he must create such beings. Other beings that are living and that have mind power, that can think, because character... Let me explain what character is. Character is the ability of a separately created entity to come to the full knowledge of the right from the wrong, of what is righteousness from what is evil or sin or unrighteousness, and to choose the right, even though he may have a desire to go the wrong way, he may be tempted to go the wrong way, but to resist the wrong, to choose the right, and have the will to do the right, and to live that way, and to proceed that way in his life. Now, God did not create people first. He didn't even create this earth first, and most people don't know that. God created angels first, and angels are spirit beings. Now, God is composed of spirit. God and the Word are both spirit, and they created angels out of spirit. Secondly, they created man much later. Now, I explain that now because in God's creative plan and the way God creates, there is nearly always the principle of duality, a first and a second. So God created angels first, and later he created man. Now, in the angels, God had one super archangel that he placed on this earth, on the throne of the earth. After he had created angels, then he created the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. I don't know how much after. I don't know when he created the heavens and the earth. I was noticing a, a television program the other night where they had some scientists talking, and they also had some uh, minister or someone who was defending the Bible talking about evolution. Some of you have seen that in the last few days. It's been on television and in television news. And it was assumed that uh, uh, the earth began and was all created in six days, as, re as explained in the first chapter of Genesis. Well, that is not true, because in the 38th chapter of Job, we find that the angels were there and already created and shouting for joy when the earth was created in Job 38. So angels were created first, beyond any doubt whatsoever. Now then, uh, I want you to notice that God on the earth, and angels were to inhabit the earth, and they inhabited this earth before man. And so we read in Second Peter, the second chapter, and verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, you know, God didn't even spare his own son. He died for us because we have sinned. But God spared not the angels that sinned. Can you imagine angels sinning? Oh, yes, they did. And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto the judgment. Uh, so angels are going to be judged, and we're going to judge angels. I wonder how many of you know that. So there is a judgment coming of angels yet. But God created a throne on this earth that ruled the whole earth. When he put angels on the earth, he had a government. And on that throne, to rule that government, God put a super archangel who was a cherub, greater than the ordinary angels, and he had been on the very throne of God, upon his wings. Uh, with another archangel, had covered the very throne of God. So he was trained at the very throne of the whole universe, on God's throne in heaven, in God's government. Now, this archangel was put on this earth to administer the government of God over those angels. Now, whether it was all the angels or only a third, I don't know, but it was a third that sinned with him. The angels sinned. Now, they're going to come to judgment. However, the archangel was named Lucifer. You read of him in the 12th 
12th chapter, uh, or the 14th chapter of Isaiah and the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. We've gone into that many times, and I just pass over it by mentioning it in this message this afternoon. But uh, <clears throat> this Lucifer was a super angel, and he had complete training. But now, character is something that God cannot create automatically himself by fiat. Character is something that has to be developed and has to be built with the consent and with the will of the separate entity that has been created, who has an independent mind. And he must have free moral agency, an independent mind to make independent free choice. God will not make that choice. But it is the one who can come to see the right, and God will make the right and the true way clear to him, who will choose that right way, decide to go that way against any pull or desire to go the wrong way. That is character. Now, God could not create that kind of character in these angels. But he put his government over them, and the right way of character is the way of God's government. And every government is based on a foundation of a constitution or a law. Now, the law of God, which is love, and our flowing love, was the basis of that. But these angels sinned, and they sinned, evidently, according to the Bible, because Lucifer, their leader, led them into that sin. Now, that Lucifer became Satan the devil. And those angels who followed him, a third of all of the angels, became demons. Now, it may have been all of the angels on earth, maybe only a third of them were placed on the earth, but apparently a third of them sinned, and apparently two thirds are holy and righteous, righteous angels today. Because they're called all of the holy angels that will come with Christ when he comes at his second coming. Now, Lucifer became Satan. He was on the throne on this earth. And according to God's uh, type of government, he must remain on that throne until the successor comes to occupy it and to restore the government of God. Because this archangel Lucifer destroyed the government of God. He rebelled against the government of God. And so from that time on, practically the whole thing in God's purpose is the restoration of the government of God, which was taken away from this earth by this Lucifer. Apparently, he has been judged. Now, as a result of the sin of the angels, chaos came to this world, this earth. It, it, uh, it, it simply became uh, waste and empty. And uh, now I'd like to turn back to uh, Psalm 104 and verse 30. Here's something very few people have noticed and very few people seem to understand. And it says, Thou, uh, 104, verse 30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, that is, God sends forth his spirit, they are created, thou renewest the face of the earth. God renewed the face of the earth, it had become decayed. Now that means, before Genesis 1 and verse 2, that the earth had been decayed, and decay is the result of something that occupies a long time, a period of time. So the earth had been created long before the time of Adam and the creation of man. Very few people know that. God has revealed these things to his church today that are not generally known. Now, I'd like to go back to Genesis 1 again. Now we come to verse 2. Verse 1 in Genesis, in the beginning, God, and the word for God is Elohim, with the you and I plural, like the word family, or the word a team, or church. More than one person, a number of people, it could be two, it could be thousands or more, but one church, one family, one whatever. In the beginning, God, which is a unite plural, created the heaven, uh, heavens, it should be plural, and it is in all other translations, and the earth. And the earth was, the word was, is elsewhere, be, uh, the Hebrew word is translated became. And to be that way, it had to become that way anyway. The earth became without form and void. Now, in the Hebrew language in which Moses wrote this, without form and void, and void was the Hebrew words tohu and bohu. Now, those words mean decayed, waste, and empty. That is a better translation than the one given here in the King James. It had become waste and empty as a result of the sin of the angels. Now, God was going to renew the face of the earth. But look, look at the condition of it in the latter half of the second verse. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was all ocean. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. Now, thou sendest forth thy Spirit, and then he renews the face of the earth. Now,
Now, it, it was all in darkness. God is light. But this Lucifer was filled with darkness and rebellion and sin. And so, darkness had come on the whole earth and everything evil. And now, God said that this is the one who spoke, the word spoke, and it was done by the Holy Spirit. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Now the light came, and then in six days, God renewed the surface of the earth. Now it was renewed for man. And so we read about man, and now in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, he's made animals, cattle after the cattle kind, dogs after the dog, dog kind, and so on. Now, God said, let us, not me, it's, it's just more than one person. That was God, the Father, and the Word. Let us make man after our kind. Man was made to become God. God put man on the earth in order that God, now the greatest feat of creation that God has ever undertaken, to reproduce himself to you and me. We can and must, if we're ever going to avoid the final lake of fire, we must become holy and righteous. We must receive God's character. We must be those that God can reproduce himself into very God beings or God persons with his holiness and his righteousness. We were made to have that contact with God. Man was created with a spirit, but he needed another spirit, the spirit of God. Adam was given that chance over the two trees. You know the story, I won't go into that just now. But Adam took, did not take the tree of life, which God offered him. Adam did not have life. He had a chemical existence, a temporary chemical existence. God offered him the tree of life. That was immortal life, the Holy Spirit. But would impregnate him with the very life of God, immortal, self-containing self-existent life. He didn't get that kind of life. Instead, he took the knowledge of good and evil to himself instead of believing God and, and letting God tell him what is good and what is evil. He rejected God because God had told him what is good and evil, and he took to himself the knowledge of good and evil contrary to what God had told him. He sinned. He rebelled against God just as Lucifer had done, and Lucifer is now Satan. Lucifer was still on that throne. And Lucifer got to Adam, and has been getting to you and me, he's still on that throne today. Lucifer has always been on that throne. Adam could have replaced him and restored the government of God. Adam didn't. So, there again is a duality. He was just the first Adam. It took a second Adam, Jesus Christ, to come. But before I pass on, after Adam made the wrong decision, he made that for his family. His family is the human family. You and I, every human being who ever lived has been born from Adam and Eve. There are our ancestors, Adam and Eve. He made that decision for all of us. Now notice, in the third chapter of Revelation, beginning with verse uh, 22, God said, Now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and live forever, then God uh, drove him out uh, of the Garden of Eden, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden carried him and a flaming sword that pointed every way to keep the way of the tree of life, lest people go back and gain immortal life in sin. To have etern eternal life, immortal life, while you are sinning, would only bring on misery, unhappiness, pain, and sorrow, and suffering. And God is not going to give you immortal life that way. He gave us a temporary existence. The result of that is, you are dying every minute you live. Now, Adam only lived 930 years, and he died. That's a long time for us. We don't live that long today. Some live 70 years today, and some very few live to 100, but some die in the first hour of their birth, as little, little infants. And so it is a temporary, chemical existence. We don't have life. That's why in Ephesians, the second chapter, in the first verse, Paul said, you were dead in trespasses and sin. We are in the process of being dead every minute we live, unless we receive life to the Holy Spirit of God. Do we understand that? You don't hear that preached much in the world today. My brethren, let us understand it. We must have the Holy Spirit of God. But now God shut off the way to that tree of life, which is the Holy Spirit, and it was shut off from the world. All right, now we come to the second Adam. The second Adam was Jesus Christ, and we come 
come over here to John, the sixth chapter, and verse 44, where Jesus said this. Now remember, man had been shut off from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draws him. Except the Father draw him, nobody could come to Christ. People think everybody can come to Christ if only they will. Whosoever will may come. You know that's in the Bible, but that's over in the last chapter in your Bible in Revelation. And that's after the millennium. That's not in this world today. That is not true now. It is not true now. That will be true at that time. So the second Adam had come. And a lot of people don't understand why Jesus came. Now, you will find that back in uh, Isaiah, the ninth chapter, in the sixth verse, it talks about Jesus being born, and he was to be born, because this was a prophecy long before his birth. It said that he would be born as an infant, but the government would be on his shoulder, and he was going to reign on the throne of his father David. He would be a son of David, and he would reign on the throne of David forever and forever. He was born to be a king. He was born to rule and to reign, to come to be a king, to replace Lucifer, who was set on the throne of his. Now do you see? The world doesn't see that, my brother. They don't understand these things. They think you're just living, you're an immortal soul already. They think that you're just going to go to heaven if you're good in your own sight. And if you're good, you're bad in your sight, and you do what you think is wrong, you go to hell. Well, nobody does what he thinks is wrong, so he thinks he's doing good. He thinks he's going to go to heaven. Well, nobody's going to go to heaven. Now, there's another prophecy, and uh, that was in, uh, uh, that other prophecy was in Isaiah 7, 14, where Christ was to be born as Emmanuel, which means God with us, and in John, or rather Matthew, the first chapter, that is explained that he uh, was, was to be born to save his people from their sins. So he came as a savior, and he came as a king. He came to save us from sin so we could receive eternal life and receive the Spirit of God. But he came to qualify to sit on that throne that Satan is on and that Lucifer had to, uh, rejected and restore the government of God. And he came as a ruler over government. Let's understand that, my brethren. Very few understand it. The churches of this world don't understand that at all. He came as a king to restore the government which Lucifer had taken away over this earth. And Lucifer is now Satan. All right. Now, a prophecy for the people. I gave you some prophecies of Christ. There is a prophecy for the people of the world. And uh, uh, that is in Joel, the second chapter, and verse uh, 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now God had held his spirit back, remember, uh, and, and had angels in the Garden of Eden so people couldn't get in. And Jesus said no man could come to him unless the Father draws them. God reserved the right to call and draw a few. Otherwise, people are not now being judged. There is a judgment day coming for all others. But judgment is on the church, and it's on you and me. And we're being judged right now as to whether we shall have eternal life or whether we're going to sin and receive the punishment of the second death in hellfire. Now, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That is not now. Only those that God calls can come to Christ now. But there will come a time when he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Now, that also is a duality and happens twice. I want to go into that. It happened on the day of Pentecost, after Christ was crucified, after he had been resurrected, and after he had ascended to heaven. And ten days after he ascended to heaven came the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit came for those God had called. It was only 120. Jesus Christ had preached to thousands upon thousands. Twice there were 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and different, uh, different groups of 5,000. And he preached to thousands at other times. Just a few here and a few there at many times. But of all those multiple thousands who heard Jesus himself, how many do you think really believed what he said? Only 120. Some believed 
knowing that they didn't believe what he said. You know, you have to agree with God to walk with him. Two cannot walk together except they be agreed. That's in Amos, I think, the third chapter in about verse 3, something like that. And you have to, uh, you have to agree with him to walk with him. All right, so in Pentecost, 31 A.D., after Jesus' ministry, uh, there was a type, and Peter said, this is that, uh, this was spoken by the prophet Joel, that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, but even then it was only those God was calling. That was a type of the millennium when he would pour out his spirit upon every human being then living on the face of the earth. But that has not come yet, because there's, there's a duality principle there. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus proclaimed uh, the kingdom of God, Mark, the first chapter. I've gone into that so many times, and I think we should all know that. But it's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Mark, the very, very first chapter, Mark's gospel, they call it gospel, it's just his biography, really, of Jesus. <clears throat> the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then it talks about John the Baptist preparing the way for him, and about to... Uh, Jesus being baptized, and then Jesus being tempted of the devil and overcoming Satan. Then coming down to verse 14, after Jesus had qualified by overcoming Satan, he qualified now to restore the government of God. He had conquered Satan. He had conquered the Lucifer that sat on that throne and still sits on that throne on this earth. He is after you and after me, and he hates us, my brother. He hates us above all the people on this earth. And he's been antagonizing me a great deal the last two months. And it's really Satan who is doing it to people who don't know what they're doing. Now, after the John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of what gospel? The gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. How is it fulfilled? Jesus has just overcome Satan and that temptation. You read about in Matthew, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 1. It's quite a long description there in Matthew's gospel uh, about how he overcame Satan. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Someone had qualified now to restore the government of God and set up the kingdom of God. Now, the government of God and the kingdom of God are two different things. There's the duality. The kingdom of God is the born family of God. We can be born into that family. But the kingdom of God is a government. And that family will, uh, uh, that family will rule will, will the government over the whole earth. Now then, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Then he said, repent ye and believe the gospel. For they stand and believe. Very few people believe what God says. And very few people repent. But on the day of Pentecost, Peter said for people that now the Holy Spirit was coming as a first type to those that God would call. Not to all flesh yet, but to all that God was calling. He said, repent and then be baptized, which means believe in Christ. That's what it represented. So, now, uh, Jesus came for the purpose of proclaiming the kingdom of God. He also came to uh, proclaim that we could be born again. Came as a savior to save us from our sins, and then we could be born again. Um, you read of that in the third chapter of John, when this uh, Pharisee Nicodemus sneaks in at night to see Jesus. He didn't want the other uh, Pharisees to see him come. He said, we, we Pharisees know that you are a man sent from God. In other words, we know you are the Messiah. Yes, they knew it. But they thought he was a, a, a sufficient going to set up a kingdom and destroy it. And they executed as the person that they believed it be. So, uh, on the day of Pentecost now, there were the 120, and later that day, thousands came in, and there were 3,000 baptized that same day. Now God began to pour out his spirit on many that he was calling. And so the first century church got started from that time on. Now I would like to read a little something that I wrote, and I'd rather just uh, read it about the first century church. Uh, what is uh, the worldwide church of 
God. Well, it is, it, it is a church that is, its purpose is to carry the great commission to all the world, proclaiming the gospel to the world the gospel of the kingdom. No one else is doing that today. Secondly, the feeding of the flock or the ministry to minister to the people. Now, those are spiritual duties. The church is not a secular organization, it is a spiritual organism. And that is the entire mission of the church. Now, uh, the church has certain supporting functions. In the first century, uh, it had deacons and deaconesses. That's all. That's all the supporting function it had, deacons and deaconesses. If they wanted to travel, they had to walk or ride on a, uh, a donkey or a mule or a horse or something, or in a rowboat or a sailboat. They didn't have any transportation, they didn't have the kind of mechanized things that we have today at all. Now, even the you find in Acts 6 and verses 2 and 3 had to be fully converted people in those offices filled with the Holy Spirit, but their operations were physical and not spiritual. But they were the supporting people that only supported uh, the church in its spiritual functions. And the functions of the church are spiritual. Now then, uh, after the day of Pentecost, uh, the uh, gospel started out and the, the church even multiplied there for a little while, and then persecution set in. And finally, it wasn't very long, in about 53 AD, the church was started in 31, and by 53 AD, the gospel was suppressed and was not preached any longer. Turn to Galatians, the first chapter, verses 6 and 7. I marvel that Paul, who goes up in the churches in Galatia, that you are so soon moved from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, a different gospel, which is not another because it is the real gospel after all, but there be some that trouble you and would prefer the gospel of Christ. The gospel was suppressed. I could go into a lot of other scriptures about that, but uh, nevertheless, I think that suffices and that, uh, uh, that will explain it. The gospel was suppressed from that time. Uh, you might say it well, it was suppressed until 1953 for exactly 1900 years. That is 100 or one century of time cycles. One century of time cycles. And uh, now we come to Jesus prophecy in Matthew 24. Matthew 24. They were in the temple at the time that this prophecy begins. Uh, they went out of the temple and uh, they departed from the temple and uh, uh, Jesus' disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Now this is the outstanding, uh, the outstanding uh, prophecy in the New Testament. Jesus said to them, "Ye out all of these things. Now what things are he talking about? Notice. Surely I say unto you, there shall not be uh, left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The temple is going to be destroyed. Now that happened in 70 AD, in their lifetime, in 70 AD. For how many years he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Well, tell us, when will these things be? That is, when the temple would be destroyed. That's what he's been talking about. And now they have to do something else. That will be the sign of your coming. And of the end of this world, then he who was coming as a great ruler to rule the world. Tell us, when shall these things be? And what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? That's the end of this age, not the end of the earth. Or the end of people on it. But the end of this time of this age. And Jesus answered and said to them, they have their own gospel about the person of Christ. And they just say, just yes, yes, yes. Thank you.
Liberty is getting the gospel of the world for the first time in more than 1900 years. And this is the earth, and you're a part of it. They were carrying that gospel out for the first time, just as Jesus said it would happen. Brother, can we wake up? Can we realize what we're doing and what is going on and how great it is in God's sight? We need to realize it. Today, we live in a far different world than the first apostles did back in Jesus' time. Multiplied population. Many, many, many times over more people on earth. Modern transportation, modern communication. I can talk anywhere in the world just in a few minutes' time by telephone. I can get on an airplane and go to any part of the world, halfway around the world, the same day. If, I, if I'm going west when I start in the morning, I'll get there before the evening, at least. Uh, and today, we have modern transportation, modern communication facilities. We have sophisticated technological instruments and uh, instrumentalities uh, in printing and uh, in uh, the publishing services to get the gospel out through print and by publishing and by television and by radio and the many ways that are open to us today. They didn't have anything like that in the first century. Facilities, uh, uh, facilities management, uh, legal services. And so they weren't bothered about legal services in those days. So they were in a complicated, mechanized world. Uh, accounting and data processing uh, functions, these are not spiritual, they are physical functions. And there is a great deal of that today. And we have those facilities to be used. But they're not spiritual, they're not the work. They're only support functions of the work. And that's one thing that I am trying to bring out now, that the work is spiritual, and the work needs supporting services. So my brethren, everyone in the supporting services, just like the deacons and deaconesses in the New Testament, should be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And we just not have people that have that technical uh, kind of uh, uh, expertise to do those things, that have been filled with the Spirit of God necessarily. Some one way, some the other. But some are of the, in the church and some are out. Now then, the gospel of the kingdom is going out and preparing the way today for Christ and for the second coming of Christ. We're preparing the way. And I would like to show you a few prophecies about that and what is going on today. Back in Malachi, the, uh, the first chapter, uh, the, the third chapter, rather, of Malachi. And I want you to notice now the first five verses of Malachi 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's Christ speaking the word. And the Lord, whom you think, who is Christ, shall suddenly come to his temple. What chapel, my brethren, is he coming to? We used to worry about that. We used to wonder, are the Jews going to walk down the, uh, the Dome of the Rock, the uh, Arabs out there, and, and build a new Jewish temple? No, they're not. They're not doing it. This is going to be done. <coughs> what temple is Christ going to come to at the second coming? All right, I'll bring that up a minute later. Uh, the Lord, whom you see, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, Christ is coming as the messenger of the covenant, whom he be right in, behold, he shall come, says the eternal of hosts. Now, you will read how John the Baptist fulfilled that. But again, there's a new reality. That was all for the first coming. But John the Baptist was a type of someone that has to prepare the way for the second coming. Let's read on. I want you to know this. What coming is it talking about here? The very next verse goes right on. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like full soap. And he shall sit as a refiner, and the purifier of silver. And he shall uh, purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver. And uh, they, uh, and uh, that they may offer unto the eternal, and uh, offering in righteousness. Then uh, shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the eternal, as in the days of old, as 
in recent years and so on. None of that happened at Christ's first coming. That is what he's going to do when he comes again to rule. So it is talking about a messenger preparing the way for the second coming of Christ. And John the Baptist was a forerunner. And it is to happen again. Christ is coming a second time. He came the first time, he's coming a second. There again, the first coming was a type of the second. In the first coming, John the Baptist was a voice crying out in the center of the wilderness of the Jordan River. And he was crying out, preparing the way for the visit of Jesus, born as a human being, to come to his people, Judah, a critical people, and coming to his people, Judah, strong and wood and gold and silver and so on. And he came to announce that someday, 1900 years before, all he would set up the kingdom of God. And he was coming to the kingdom of God, and he came to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And that was the purpose of his coming. And to call people to be born again into it and be children of God, in the family of God, and the family of God is the kingdom of God, the born family of God, that will then rule all nations of the world. But now, there must be a messenger preparing the way for the second coming of Christ. A voice crying out not in the physical wilderness of the Jordan River, but the spiritual wilderness of religious confusion all over the modern complex that still rule today. And preparing the way before the spiritual of Christ in power and glory who is coming to his spiritual temple. I'm going to show you what that is in a moment. He's not coming to a physical people, but his spiritual people. And he's coming not to a temple made in, 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 in stone and wood and gold and silver, but made out of spirit, because the church is going to rise up and meet him, and it will be the day that Christ will rise first, and we will turn away from the man of the cross and the man of the earth. And we will be changed and we will become God beings in the family of God. And we, with him, will constitute the kingdom of God, the family of God. Christ is coming to win all our nations and we're going to rule away. As you read in the very latter part of both the, uh, well, the way to see the church and the, uh, the Philadelphia church, or, or, or the, uh, well, it's one of the other churches. Anyway, uh, it's Revelation 2.26. And now then, I'd like to have you notice again. Uh, well, let's turn now for a moment back to, uh, back to Haggai, the second chapter. And I want you to notice something here. This is a time, 70 years after Solomon's temple had been destroyed, when some people were coming to build that first temple that Jesus came to the first time. Now let's talk a little about that temple, and then we're going to learn something about the second temple. Here again is the duality. That first temple that Jesus came to, and the second temple is spiritual, and he's coming to the second time. Now then, a colony of Jews had been sent back from uh, the Chaldean Empire, which had been succeeded by the Persian Empire, and the Persia had sent them back there. And uh, a man, uh, the name is Zerubbabel, was the leader of that uh, colony, and uh, he uh, uh, he was the governor, and also he was the one uh, that was the builder of the second temple. That is, he directed it all. He directed to those who did do it. Now we've been reading about that here in uh, Haggai, the uh, second chapter, beginning with verse three. Haggai two, verse three. Who is there who is left among you? that saw this house, that is the, uh, the temple of Solomon, that we heard before, saw this house in her first glory. And uh, how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes, as uh, uh, your eyes in comparison uh, of it as nothing? It is all destroyed. There might have been some of the stones left there at that time, but it was nothing. It had been totally destroyed. So then he says, Let's now be strong out of Zerubbabel. And then old Joshua, uh, who was with him as the high priest, and work, for I am with you, at work to build this physical temple. 
I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, uh, so uh, my spirit remaineth among you, tell you not. For that says the eternal of hosts, yet not in the little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. That is when, that's talking about the day of the Lord when he's going to do that very thing. That hasn't happened yet in our time. But it's going to happen in just a very few years right now. We're coming right down to that time. And then he continues, verse 7, And I will shake the nation, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will uh, fill this house with glory, says uh, the eternal of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this matter house. Now he's talking about the end time now. It's a prophecy for the end time. But he's using the house as Rebecca was building as a type of the water house. Now notice that this, the glory of this water house shall be greater than that of the former, greater than Solomon's temple. Well, the temple where he built was not as great as uh, glory as Solomon's temple on earth or near. It was larger. But it was not as great, it's not as beautiful, not as, uh, not as fine, it didn't have as much gold and precious stones and things like that. So, he's talking about a temple that will be more glorious even than Solomon's temple. He's talking about a temple in which Christ will come. So, rather, there is a type of someone that would build the temple Christ is coming to. And that has to be someone preparing the way for the second coming, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God just before and in the very generation where that kingdom is going to be set up. We're at that time now, my brethren. We're at that time. And it means raising up the church because you find over here in Ephesians. Let me turn to that. Ephesians now. The... Uh, Second chapter of Ephesians, and uh, God says here, beginning with verse 19, to the church of Ephesus, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. They have been Gentiles, they were born Gentiles, they were not Jews. But of the uh, our citizens were the saints. They're no more foreigners, but in the same nation as the saints. Now he's speaking of the church of the nation. Now he's speaking of the church of many things here. This uh, verse he speaks of it as a nation, and now it says of the household of God, now of the family, for to be the family of God, now go on, and uh, are built upon the foundation. Now we're building, and the foundation is the apostles and the prophets. That's the foundation of the church. That's what he's talking about. Built upon the foundation of the apostles, the, the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself was chief cornerstone, uh, in whom uh, all the building, now the church is a building, simply framed up together, built into an holy temple. That's the temple to which Christ is coming, not a temple made of stone or building, but a spiritual temple, brethren. You are that temple. You are know that temple with me, and I hope I'm part of it. That's why God calls us holy and righteous. We ought to become that. Maybe we're not as holy and righteous as we ought to be. Let's spend a little more time in prayer. Let's spend a little more time in Bible study. Let's spend a little more time in contemplation and thinking about the things of God than we've been doing. We've had our minds too much on the things of this world, on the carnal things. On the things money will buy, let's put a little more of the money into the work of God and get it going. We don't have much time left. We're coming in on the home stretch right now. Now then, there's a duality between Haggai 2 and Ephesians 2. Did you notice that Haggai 2 was speaking of the first temple, which the Rebbe built. Ephesians 2 is speaking of the second temple, which Christ is building through one he is called to do that. Now, I'd like to get, give you a, one little prophecy in the New Testament in, uh, in Revelation 3, and uh, uh, verses uh, 7 and 8. This is the Philadelphia church. I'm speaking of our church today. Verses 7 and 8. 
and to the angel of the church and in Philadelphia right. Now there are some that think the word angel merely means messenger, and it does in the Greek language, the word is uh, uh, angelos, uh, and often it is used for human messengers when it has to be human. The same word is used, also it means uh, spirit angel, composed of spirit, uh, and, and they were immortal and invisible. But the same word is used for humans who are messengers. And uh, so this could be either. Uh, right. These things, say to me that is holy, he that is true, to me that has the key of David, and the open up for no man to shut up, and the shut up for no man can open. That's the gift of Christ. I know thy word, she says, to this church, and that's the gift. You, you brethren, there are something, I think even more than 5,000 of you right now. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. A better translation is you have all a little strength. And then you wake physically. Now I'll speak later in Zechariah about the other of the Old Testament. It's not that power. He wasn't such a strong man either. But he says, My life spirit says the eternal. It's the power of the Spirit of God that this work must go for, not in human power. I know thy work. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it. You have but little strength. And have kept my word. Has believed what he said and kept his word and has not watered it down. And has not compromised. And when I found a water down, brother, we got back onto the track. We're all most back there, it's not entirely. And we must get all the way back. And has not denied my name. The doors have been opened. This was the door of radio and television, the printing press. Then doors to, as you read in the 10th chapter of Revelation. But to, finally, after we thought the work was all done, you must go now to many nations, speaking many languages, and to kings and the kings of nations, and that has been done in the last ten years, my brother. God has opened those doors, and you, through me, have been walking through those doors, and the job is getting done. Now, I would like to show you a little bit of how God, how God prepared one for this job. Back in 1926, after a successful business career, I was challenged, and I was challenged about the law of God as the foundation of the government of God. God used that very thing to challenge me to uh, or that the law is the way to, to characterize. I, I remember I just lost on that in my notes here. Uh, I was challenged on the Sabbath, and that is in the law of God. And the one point of the law of God that is a test commandment, the one commandment the world will reject and is not willing to keep. And I don't want to keep it either. And you know, I found I didn't agree with God. I believed what I'd been brought up to believe. I thought we were immortal souls. I thought we'd go to heaven if we were good, and to hell if we were bad, and we would live forever. And I saw in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And I said, well, that's not what I've been taught. I've always believed the wages of sin is immortal life, but it's in hell fire. But the gift of God is eternal life. I said, why would it be a gift of God if I already have it? If I already have immortal life, which I thought I had, but I had to find I didn't. And I didn't have God's food, I didn't have the presence of immortal life within me at that time. So I found out a lot more. Now I came to the place where it finally came to a challenge. I proved the truth about God's Sabbath and kept one thing. I came to Colossians 2 and verse 16. And that stopped me. And I thought, well, that does away with the Sabbath. And then I found out it didn't do away with the Sabbath at all. But it also included the annual holidays. And I said, well, when if it doesn't do away with the Sabbath, it doesn't do away with the annual holy days. And I found out that Jesus kept those days, and the apostles 
and they were all ordained forever. And so, when I was converted, my wife and I began to keep you on your holy days, and nobody else we knew our fathers was doing it. We were no one that would. I went to the church, it was the Sardis church, and they laughed, made a scorn when I tried to show them the truth about observing the annual holy days and the festivals of God. I didn't understand altogether about the festivals yet, but I did about the annual holy days. Uh, now, I learned at that time about the resurrection of Christ after three days and three nights. And I learned at Easter, and I began to learn uh, about Christmas. And I learned that Easter did not celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Then I learned what is in the, the United States of Prophecy, and that was written way back in more than 50 years ago when I wrote that. It's in the time, it's all up to date, and updated a little bit, but primarily that book was the United States of Western Prophecy, was written over 50 years ago. Uh, and I learned then about the gospel of the kingdom, which is not preached, and nobody seems to know about it today. Then in the book of Revelation, it led me to Daniel. I, I was going through the book of Revelation. The question was Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, and going back to Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 that explains it. And in Daniel 2, 44, I saw the truth of the kingdom of God. And uh, then I came to find out there were angels on earth. And the When the church was 
not crumbling at the word of God, but watering it down there for about ten years. The church didn't grow. I hope that it'll begin to grow again. As a matter of fact, in the past year, much of the church has grown 30% once again. In the United States, we have grown not up to 30, but we're up in practically the 20% mark. And it looks like we're on a 30% increase this year. If we will tighten our belts, if we will sacrifice, uh, we've got to have our brethren put in more money. We've got to go on more television stations. So what I'm trying to do, four television programs a week, and four radio programs a week, besides keeping up with all the writing, and all the preaching, and everything else that I do. Last Sabbath I was preaching over in uh, Big Sandy. We had over, uh, let's see, it was uh, over, over, over 3,000, over 3,000 people that I'm speaking to more than 5,000 of you today. Next Sabbath I'm going to be speaking to a combined group in Denver, Colorado. Three weeks ago I was speaking to 2,800 up in uh, uh, Seattle. And I'm trying to plan now to go up to a group every two weeks. And speak. I'm putting on the pressure, and if I can do it at my age, I think you can do your part. And I ask all of you to do your part. And I ask you to pray more and pray for me. I need it. Let me. Satan is trying to destroy me. He would love to destroy me. But he can't do it if God doesn't let him. And I need your prayers. And I need you to pray that, that I can keep praying because. Satan makes it very tough sometimes. Brother, we've got a great job to do. Let's get in there and put our whole hearts and souls into it and do it. So, thank you all, brother, and I know I can count on you, and I know we'll count on one another, and we'll go into glory, and it won't be too long until we will. Thank you very much.